Well, hey, good morning, everybody. How we doing? This is the awake crowd, right? This is the crowd that said, you know what? 11 o'clock it is today. Am I, am I right? Anything? Come on. 9.30, they were dead this morning, okay? So we need you to wake up. You with me? All right, perfect. Half of you are... All right, we're going to jump in. Uh, for those of you that don't know kind of where we're at or what we're doing right now, we're in the middle of a series tracking through the gospel of Mark. And uh, we as a teaching team, uh, so Brian, myself, and then John and Brad, the pastors at the other two churches, a part of our network, um, really spent some time discerning, God, what do you want for us in this next season? And we really felt like he put on our hearts, just go through the gospel. And so that's what we're doing. We're just going week by week, chunk by chunk, just working through the gospel of Mark. And what we're going to be in today is Mark chapter 8, the first section that we went through for January and February. Uh, we called it Jesus Unfiltered, which the lens in which we looked through and kind of discerned through was who was Jesus really? All about Jesus and his identity. Uh, this next piece that we're in right now for March and then some of April uh, is called Jesus Unwavering because it's more focused on, and just as we read the gospel, it's more focused on what Jesus did. So that's the lens that we're going to look through. But to understand the context of the story that we're stepping into today, I want to tell you where we're at uh, on a map, or at least take you there through a picture. So this is a picture. This is Galilee. Uh, you can kind of see the Sea of Galilee is actually going to be like behind us here in the image. But this is kind of like a, uh, an open terrain. Uh, you kind of see there's some shrubbery. There's a decent amount of greenery because of the time of the year. But in the far off, you can see the mountains. And mountains, uh, as you know, uh, especially in arid places, mountains tend to be dry. They tend to be rocky and sandy. And so this is more of a dry and arid place. And this next photo is going to show you just a little bit more about kind of the setting somewhat that Jesus and his disciples and this group of 4,000 people are going to find themselves in. So you can see there's a little bit more farmland, but now you see a whole lot more brown. Brown is more the area or the environment that our text is going to be mostly focused on today. So you see the mountains in the background, but let me show you a map of where Jesus has been and where Jesus is traveling. Where we're at right now, Jesus was just in Tyre. Then he went north and he went to Sidon. And then he's headed to Caesarea Philippi. But kind of like us today, and you know how traffic flows and highways move around the contours of land, just like this, there is not a direct route that is convenient or safe to go straight from Sidon, or Sidon, where you say it, to Caesarea Philippi. You have to kind of go around because there's a mountain system that's right in there. So Jesus and his disciples are somewhere in this text between Sidon and Caesarea Philippi, probably this area. There's not a lot of towns. There's not a lot of people. It's relatively remote. But what we're going to find is people from all over the place came into here. So this is Mark chapter 8, verse 1. It says this, during those days, another large crowd gathered. So they're in the desert. They're in the wilderness. And it says, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. So this crowd that had been following Jesus, what happened is they stayed longer than they had anticipated. They're in a more remote region. It's more desolate. And so it would be normal for people to come and to bring food, to pack a lunch, to bring provisions for themselves or for their families, for other people. So they showed up and it says Jesus was with them for three days. Jesus said, they've been with me three days. They're out. They're empty. They don't have any more food. They're hungry. If I send them away, some are, they're just going to collapse because they're so hungry. They need food. So Jesus turns to his disciples and said, let's feed them. Let's keep reading. His disciple answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Jesus, this is 4,000 people. 4,000 people. How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. Now, you're going to laugh a little bit today, okay? Because this is funny. Here's why this is funny. Uh, let's say we're at Van Andel, and it's lunchtime. And we've all been there for three days. And we're really hungry. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're, we're beyond, like, the, yeah, I, I could use something. We are hungry. And the disciples come up, and they say, Jesus, um, here's what we have. Here's what we're working with. Um, we got seven of these. How many people are in the desert? Come on, say it like you believe it. How many people are in the desert? There's 4,000 people. And the disciples go, 
You think this will do it? There's seven. What are they gonna do? They're gonna pass it around and everybody just lick the thing? Think about it. 4,000 people are hungry in the middle of the desert with no Arby's, no Jimmy John's, no McDonald's. There's nothing close. The disciples are saying, we, uh, what do you want us to, here's what we got. We got seven. We got seven. Let's keep reading. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. This is one of my favorite lines in this story. Let me translate it for you. This is the David Standard version. Uh, take a seat. I'm about to do work. Right? Have them sit down. Tell the people to sit down. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And they did so. So he breaks it. Jimmy John's wrappers are tough, apparently. He takes the bread and he breaks it and he hands it to his disciples. He says, start handing it out. Start handing it out. They had a few small fish as well. I love that little line too. You gotta imagine like three people in the audience going, I'm gluten free, I'll die. Here's some fish too, we'll pass out the fish. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. So they're passing out bread, they're passing out fish. And just, I've read this story for years. How many of you, you just look at this and you go, I actually wanna know how that happened. Right, isn't there like a curiosity in you of like, what? imagine you're a disciple, you're Peter. Okay, you're Peter, and you're going, I'm gonna watch that thing like a hawk. So they take a piece. Okay, good, it looks a little smaller. They take a piece, it's still getting smaller. They take a piece, I missed it for one second. Why is it bigger? You know what I mean? Like it just, they keep handing it and handing it and handing it and handing it and handing it. And so you're following these seven loaves, and here's what happens. The people ate and were, what? What happened between seven loaves and 4,000 people being satisfied? What happened between seven loaves and 4,000 people being satisfied? What did we miss? What did we miss? Can you imagine the disciples at this point who, this is just a fun fact, um, had only ever called Jesus teacher? up until this point. Can you imagine watching your teacher who said some great things, who's done some amazing things, but now who has the ability to take seven loaves, seven small, seven not gonna do the job, seven, you know, I guess we'll, we'll work with what we can work with, seven loaves to feed 4,000 people, not to the point that they walk away and they go, yeah, that was a good snack, that they walk away satisfied. Can you imagine them? being a high school boy saying, I need to learn me how to do that because I will never buy food again. Isn't it true that God can often take a little bit and turn it into a lot? And what I want you to catch is Jesus, who's moved with compassion, saw the people in his midst and wanted to provide for them something that their environment could not provide for them. That he looked at the people and saw them hungry and saw no place for them to get what they needed and Jesus moved. Although a little at first, he fed them to the point of satisfaction. What's the last time that you were satisfied? It's the last time that you just, you longed for something or you wanted something or you needed something and then you finally got it and there was a real sense of satisfaction that, that sustained. Here's what happens if we keep reading Mark chapter eight, verse eight. It says, afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. Isn't it so true that when God shows up and God provides, he has the ability to take just a little bit, the faithfulness of just a little, and say, watch what I can do. 
moved with compassion in a heart for the people that were there who were hungry, who were sweaty, who had stayed longer than they thought, whose loaves, all they wanted was something to eat so that they could be satisfied, so that their hunger could be quenched. All they wanted was sustenance. And Jesus says, I can take a little bit and turn it into a lot. And in fact, I can turn it into more than a lot. I can turn it into an abundance. Moved out of this heart for compassion. Why did Jesus feed all these people? Can we just ask like a, like just a blatant question? Why did Jesus do this? Is it about lunch? Or is it about something more? Is it about something deeper than lunch? We love to celebrate the miracle, but sometimes we miss the purpose of it. Let's reread Mark chapter eight, verse one. It says this, during those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have what? I have compassion. Do you know what compassion translates to? Like when you, when you look at the original form of the word, compassion was tied to the bowels. This is weird. That Jesus, it says, Jesus had such compassion that it moved him on a gut level. Let me define it for you. This is what it says. Um, compassion means to have the bowels yearn. One person gets it. This is funny. Loosen up. Come on. The bowels are yearning and Jesus goes, we're going to feed them. There's something more here. Are you with me? There's something more going on that's underneath this that Jesus turns and he looks at a group of 4,000 hungry people and it says his stomach hurt. Because he's looking out at this group of people whom he loves who has outstayed their provision because they finally got a taste of Jesus. And I want you to catch this. It didn't say all the people left because they were hungry. The people were present because they were hungry for the thing that was meeting their spiritual hunger. They longed for and desired and wanted what only Jesus could provide. So they said no to their physical hunger to say yes to their spiritual hunger. And Jesus looked at a group of spiritually hungry people and said, my stomach hurts for them. That I love them on such a deep level I want to provide for them physically. But we all know that there's a deeper purpose and a deeper reason for why Jesus fed all these people because he also wanted to feed something in their souls. So imagine the disciples. Uh, at this point, I mean, we've tracked with Jesus for a decent amount of time now. We're on the third month now that we've been in here. And Jesus spends a lot of time in different Jewish areas. In fact, Jesus just, a couple chapters earlier, just fed 5,000 people, but in a predominantly Jewish area. And so there were 12 loaves and, and he broke the bread and he gave thanks and then he fed all 5,000 of these people and collected 12 basketfuls later. So the disciples had just seen something like this a couple chapters earlier and now they're watching Jesus and now they're in a different part of the region. Now they're in a predominantly Gentile area. Can I, can I just say this? Jews and Gentiles, especially in this time, did not interact. They kept each other at arm's distance. I don't think the disciples would have looked at a group of Gentiles, non-Jews, people not like them, people different than them. I don't think the disciples would look and go, my stomach hurts for them. I think if they're anything like us, they might go like this. Why are we still here? Why are we spending time with them? We've waited for a Messiah for us. You invited us on a journey. You gave us the invitation. Why are we with a group of people not like us in a region not our home? Why is Jesus so moved with compassion for people that are nothing like the disciples that were with them? Here's what I wanna know. I wanna know what Jesus saw to stir such great compassion. 
You ever feel like you're in the desert? You ever feel like you're just stuck? Like where you look around, there's not a lot of hope or there's not a lot of good news or there's not a lot of life. Maybe it's at work or maybe it's in a marriage or maybe it's parenting or maybe it's looking for a job. Whatever, you ever feel like I'm just in a desert? What I need, I don't have. Uh, I, I had the privilege, privilege, I use that air quotes. Everybody write privilege in air quotes when I say this. I had the privilege of living in New Mexico for three months when I was in college. And uh, it was not a privilege. In fact, it looked like this. Um, some of you go, oh, that's cool. It's like a change of scenery and it's different than Michigan normally provides. I hated it, okay? Because it's hot. It is hot, hot. Like it's rugged, it's dirty, it's sandy, it's hard. There's crusty rocks everywhere. It's dust blows everywhere. You can see for miles because nothing grows there, right? And I know some of you, right? You're analyzing, you're going, well, I see a tree there and I see bushes. You know what's under the trees and the bushes? Snakes and scorpions. So do you think you want to be underneath something green and shady when you're in the middle of the desert? No. So you know where you go instead? You go right in this general area and you just bake. I hate the desert. I don't know about you. Some of you like to visit the desert. It's because you live here, right? You go, sun, I'll take sun. Sun will kill you, okay? You wait long enough, it'll kill you. So these people are in the middle of the desert, in the middle of this rocky, dirty, arid, lifeless, dry area, longing for something more, longing for life, longing for water, longing for food, longing for provision, because the environment around them isn't providing it. Do you ever feel like we live in the desert? You ever feel like that? Sometimes I look at our world and feel very much so like we live in the desert. And some of you may say, well, we live in a free country. Look at our political system. Does that feel life-giving? Ha, 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 nervous laughter. What's he gonna say next? <laughs> I don't care whose side you're on. It's life-draining, is it not? I'm so sick of watching people throw stones at each other and rip people to shreds only to switch teams or stab in the back and work for this group of people or this. Doesn't it feel like the desert? We as the church should be sick of it. What about this? Do you know there's 68 million refugees in our, or in our world today? 68 million refugees. The average stay, I just learned this this last week, the average stay in a refugee camp is 20 years. We have 68 million people who have been displaced from their home for as long as they know, maybe forever. What about this? On any given day, there's 443,000 kids in foster care. There's 2.2 million people incarcerated in our country alone right now. Do you ever feel like we just live in the desert? And then we watch the news and we see things like the coronavirus. We see the flu, we see different outbreaks. We see the CDC come out again. I mean, it's like, you ever just look around and go, there's just not a lot of life. In fact, it's pretty arid, it's pretty dry, it's pretty dead. And it's not super safe. I think when Jesus looked at the people in the desert, that's what he saw. I think that's what he saw. I think he saw people who were sick of life as they knew it, who were sick of fearing for their lives and scraping by, who were sick of lifeless work environments and families and marriages. I think he saw the brokenness and the depravity and the spiritual hunger that people had for something so much more that their world and that their environment could not provide for. And Jesus says, oh, I love them so much. My stomach hurts for them. I think that's what Jesus saw because they were hungry for something that only he could provide. Imagine you're one of the disciples. 
So you're tracking with Jesus, you're watching Jesus, he's doing these incredible things. Now he just fed 4,000 people, your mind is blown, you're like, how cool is that? And you head back into like the city. You finally get back to the area that you're going to. This is Mark chapter eight, verse 11. They head, they head back in and it says, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. To what? To test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. Jesus just does this incredible work in the desert and the people, the Gentiles, and then a couple days or weeks earlier, he does it with the Jews. And so the disciples have watched and they're blown away by who Jesus is. And then the Pharisees and the religious leaders show up and question and test and they say, Jesus, we don't really believe you are what you say you are. We don't believe you can do what you say you can do. We don't really believe anything that you say. So prove to us that what you're saying is true. Show us a sign. Bring it down from heaven. Show us this sign. And Jesus sighs deeply. <sighs> Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. We have the luxury of reading this 2,000 years later, watching Jesus move, seeing the ark, seeing how he was doing things so strategically and specifically, how he was investing in the life, the lives of his disciples and saying, I just wanna show you, just peek at this, look at this. And now watch me move right over here, look at this. And, and here's another sign, do you see? This is, everything I'm saying is true, it's pointing. Look, look, do you see, do you get it, do you get it? Isn't it so funny that Jesus, as soon as he gets around Pharisees, the religious leaders, the most educated and, and sophisticated and honorable people in the community who are blind as bats to see what Jesus is doing and what it speaks to. So let's keep reading. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread. So they get in a boat, they start leaving. And this, this is just funny, okay? Can you appreciate this? The disciples had forgotten to bring bread after a season, after this incredible movement of God in which 4,000 people ate food. From seven of these, 4,000 people eat food and they leave satisfied and the disciples pick up seven basketfuls and they get in the boat and they leave shore and you ever have that like, oh shoot moment where you forget something? The disciples go, are you kidding me right now? I thought you were grabbing the bread. I grabbed it last time. I didn't see you picking up the baskets. And you see them just going back and forth, going, we forgot bread. Oh, I love this. Except for one loaf that they had with them in the boat. Peter goes, neener, neener, neener. <laughs> I remembered. Be careful. Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. What is that? What's the yeast? Yeast, as most of you know, tiny little living organism that we put in bread and we knead it through the bread and it actually brings life to the whole bread, right? It, it makes it rise later. Jesus said there's something else that they do that doesn't bring life, but it affects the whole batch. Watch out for the yeast. They discussed this with one another and they said it's because we have no bread. You, they missed it again. You following this? They can't see, Jesus is teeing them up over and over and over. Watch out for the, Jesus is saying to them, watch out for the unbelief of the Pharisees and of Herod. Watch out for their blindness because their blindness can be contagious. Because when we seek things and when we look for things and when we run for things that aren't Jesus and we try to fill the gap that only Jesus can fill, that and when we surround ourselves with people, with leaders who are running towards stuff like this, who are blind to what God is doing, Jesus says, careful of them. Watch out. That'll affect you. Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Let's keep reading here. Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? 
And don't you remember, watch this, Jesus, we're gonna go back. Ready? Everybody track with me. Here we go. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, remember Jewish community, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12. Okay. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? He answered, seven. Do you still not understand? When Jesus was with the Jews, the 12 basketfuls left over, and a good Jew would notice, or they'd start to question and start to ask, 12 basketfuls left over, 12 loaves to begin with? Aren't there 12 tribes of Judah? These are the Jewish people. They were waiting for a Messiah. And Jesus goes, pattern, pattern, pattern. Do you get it? Nope, still don't get it. All right, we'll keep going. When I broke the seven, hold on, go back. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. Well, seven, now they're in a Gentile area. And there was one text as I was reading it, it said, we're not totally sure what seven would have spoken to, but there was one uh, passage of scripture in which God says he was gonna drive out the seven Gentile nations. So hold on here. Jesus has 12 left over for the Jews. Yep, check. And seven left over for the Gentiles. Could it be that Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah that came for both Jews and Gentiles? Do you see this here? I came for the Jews, but not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. It, the Pharisees demand a sign. They want a sign. They can't see what's right in front of them. Can you? Do you see me for who I am? Do you see the sign? And notice the Pharisees come hungry, but leave hungry. The people who came and sought Jesus came hungry, but left satisfied. Jesus is saying, this whole thing is about me. That I came for people in the desert. I came for people who are hungry. I came for people who were sinful. I came for people who were ashamed. I came for people who were sick. I came for people who were lonely. I came for the lost and the forgotten and the hurting. That's why I came. And look, every sign points to me. The feeding of the 4,000 was never about lunch. It was about provision from heaven. A couple of verses later, Mark 8, verse 27, Jesus is walking with his disciples. It says, they went onto the villages around Caesarea Philippi and on the way he asked them, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Jesus looks at his disciples. Come on guys, you've followed me. You've listened to me. You've watched me. You've helped me. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Peter finally gets it. And the blindness disappears. So many of us forget that our Messiah is not our next president. Feel free to write that one down. So many of us forget that our Messiah is not our 401k. It's not retirement. It's not a good job. It's not cancer in remission. It's not anything but Jesus. And whenever we long for or hunger for things that aren't him, we, just like the Pharisees, will leave empty and hungry because there's a sized gap in our hearts that can only be filled by the person of Jesus. What he did always pointed to who he was. And when they talk about bread, he was saying, it's not about bread for your stomach. It's about me, the bread of life for your soul. 
Shannon and I just moved to a new neighborhood a couple months ago, and uh, I like meeting new people. I don't know if you knew that. I like meeting new people. I think it's kind of fun. And so we've been there a couple months and we were waiting for like a good day. And so we went outside and I had some fun with Judah. We put Judah in like a little cozy coop car, you know what I'm talking about? And it's a police car, which just makes me so happy. And so I hooked up like a leash to it and I literally dragged it down the road, kind of zigzag, like I'm, I'm fishtailing him. You know, like this is Ozzy, he's one. I'm like, this will be good for him. So we're fishtailing, we're pulling the dog over and everything like that. And, and it turns out a bunch of our neighbors are outside. So we go up and we, we start meeting neighbors and going, hey, how are you? Been so looking forward to meeting you and this and that. And, and this is what was really funny is uh, every one of our neighbors we met warned us. They said, hey, we just want to let you know, watch out for, uh, for those people over there. You go, oh, our direct neighbors? Why is that? Every single one of them. You gotta watch out for them, man. I mean, they're, they will blare music late at night. One of them was like, but good taste. But, you know, blare it late into the night. And, and you gotta watch out. I mean, that is language and who knows what they got growing in the back, if you know what I mean. Wank, wank. And, and, and so they're all telling me this stuff. And I see my wife, like the blood draining from her face. Like, where did we just move? And I'm going, really? Have you met them? And they go, No. Well, how do you know all this? You know, doing recon missions, snooping around in their backyard, like, what are we gonna find back here? Every one of us warned us of these neighbors. One had one interaction with them ever. So I said, I would like to meet these people. <laughs> right? I'm living next to them now. We better find out if we're gonna have to move. So I, no joke, we said hi, we met these neighbors, super fun, headed off, we are walking back and all of a sudden I hear this engine start. It's like a 69 Jeep, super loud, no muffler, I promise. Then we're walking up and I'm like, are you kidding me? He's home right now. Yes. So Shannon goes up to the garage and takes Judah and I'm going, whoop, see ya. So I come over and I go, hey there neighbor, can I come over? And you guys, I gotta tell you, I've, I've grown up in church pretty much my entire life. I learned new words this time. <laughs> I, I mean, just the way he kind of strung them together was impressive. <laughs> and so I just said, hey, I'm David. I'm your new neighbor. Tell me about you. And, and, and just start sharing. Well, this is who I am and blankety blank this and blank that. And I'm going, all right, great. Awesome. That's a new one too. <laughs> and we're talking and, and then he starts sharing. And, and I'm like, well, how you doing? And he goes, well, I, I got... I got some health issues and really like, like what? I started sharing. I got issues and this and that. And I was a Vietnam vet. And so I think I might've had some of that agent orange stuff and go, wow. Yeah. And I had some run-ins with the law and I had some marital issues. And <laughs> when I asked him, I was like, you like being a grandpa? He goes, no, I'm done with that. <laughs> okay. And then he goes, what do you do for work? I'm like, I can't lie. I can't lie. What, social justice? No, community leader. <laughs> I just can't. Oh, oh, I wish I played guitar. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I go, I'm a pastor. And he goes, ha, huh. I think God's trying to get me back. I said, why do you say that? He said, my life has kind of gone in cycles. And I keep getting worse than when I started off. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And God keeps giving me these signs. And I loved the neighbors who used to live in your house. I loved them. And I was sad to see him go. And I said, can I tell you something? God's been chasing me too. And I got to share a little bit of my story and a little bit of my past and a little bit of my hurt. And I said to him, I can't offer you a lot. Not a little bit. If you ever want somebody to talk to, since nobody else on our neighborhood will, <laughs> if you ever want someone to talk to, please call me. 
If you ever want to grab breakfast, please tell me. I'd love to see what you got going on back here. That's a weird one. <laughs> you got a lot going on. I mean, everyone show me. The band just got that. I said, if you ever need somebody, I'm here. Friends, our world is hungry. It's not that scary. It's really not. The world might be hangry, but the core of there is they're hungry for something that the world around them won't provide. And do you want to know something? We got it. We got it. Jesus looked at the world. Jesus looked at you and me. And he said, they just look broken and lost and sick and hurting and lonely. And they're just, they're just fighting to survive. And I have what can meet their needs. And what he's tasked us with is the church. If you say, I've made Jesus Lord of my life. He is my king. I follow him. He says, here's your job. Would you just feed the world? Don't, don't just feed their stomachs, feed their souls. Build bridges, start conversations, have people in your home. We talk about refugees. I just got an email this week that said all they need is friends. That doesn't cost you much. Foster care, what's it look like to open them up and bring kids in your home and show them what the love of Jesus actually looks like? What's it look like to feed hungry people that we see on the street? What's it look like to move towards hungry people when we have what they so desperately want? So here's what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna close today is...